I don't want no oil A spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things A creeping and crawling Won't trade no more oil for blood The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run but that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit. Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus, and hello to those of you listening on the internet, wherever and whenever you are. My name is Joe DeMar, and you have been lucky enough to tune into For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a show where we talk about ecology and the environment. We talk about them in the ways that they affect you, your wealth, your health, your happiness, the happiness of your friends and families and pets and, and those all around you. We have a great show lined up for you today. We have a special guest calling in at 8.15. Dr. Julia Hale is coming on. Uh, you may remember her. We had her back on in, in first time in the spring, and she is an expert on viruses. Uh, her speciality is actually retroviruses, but we're going to be talking about uh, sort of viruses in general and, and like how they propagate in populations when there's a, a new virus that gets into a new population because guess what we're we're a population and there's a new virus getting into us and i think it's a good time the way it's taken off now to just sort of remind us of the science behind this situation and then of course we're going to have a uh, hear from our sponsors at the bottom of the hour rebecca wood will be joining us she's got some interesting stuff she's uh, been looking at the way she always does uh, we've got some environmental news and information and we have uh, our letter from the future and that's our show and let's hope that we also have you at 866-240-1065 that's 866-240-1065 call anytime during this hour and we will happily put you on the air had a nice call from kevin last week that was very good uh, any environmental question you've got any ecological thing that you've been wondering about it doesn't have to be a response to what we're talking about on the show. This is the best show in Ohio, but it gets better every time you call. And speaking of science, remembering the science of things like uh, viruses and so forth, I just want to talk a little bit about the scientific method. You know, we, we all learned about this back in elementary school, but I, I think maybe we need a reminder because there's different ways of arriving at your, your personal truths. I mean, we all have to operate on what we believe is true. And so the question is, how do you get to that truth? And the best way that the Western civilization has come up with, I mean, there's other civilizations and they have other methods, but the best way Western civilization has come up with is uh, what we call the scientific method. That's as opposed to the I wish it were true method. <laughs> And, you know, the, the, if you, the I wish it were true method is very simple. You just decide what you want, and then you say that that's the truth and that that's how it is. And, you know, that can be personally very gratifying, and it, you, can, you can justify pretty much any action you ever take by using the, this method. But if there's something called objective truth, which I believe there is, uh, then a much better way to do it is the scientific method. And the first step in the scientific method is what we call as observation. You know, the first step in the scientific method isn't, you know, I think this is true, 
and and you just start acting on that belief. No, the first step is you look at the world around you. You look at things that are happening. You look at phenomenon, and you and you don't. You first just look at everything with an open mind. You don't jump to a conclusion when you're in that observation stage. You just look and and consider, and eventually you can progress to the second step, which is you you create a hypothesis. That is, you guess. You, but it's an educated guess. It, it's it's a guess based on the observation. You don't just uh, jump again. You don't just jump right to the conclusion. But looking at the observations that you've made, you make a, a, an educated guess as to what's going on. You think, okay, I think I've got this figured out. You know, I, I think this is what's happening. And once you've done that, then you're ready to try on the next step. You're ready to move on to the experimental step. And this is the part where we start thinking about scientists. You know, when we have our picture of scientists, we're always thinking about, okay, they're conducting experiments, they're in the lab, they're out in the field, they're collecting data, you know, they're they're performing experiments. That's true, but before they got to that third step, they went through the first and the second step. It's very important. And so, you know, my best example I think of is for the experimental phase is uh, I, I think of way back in 1719, there was a scientist named Stephen Hales, and he was the one who figured out that trees, that plants, actually grow most of what a tree is doesn't come from the ground, doesn't come from the dirt. Because most of the because before that everybody just thought, well, plants grow in the dirt, so they're they're getting what they physically are made up of. They're just sucking it out of the dirt and turning it into plants somehow. But he he was the first one who figured out, well, you you put you grow a tree, and he had a he had a big bucket of dirt, and he planted a seed, and he grew a tree in that in that dirt, and he let it grow, and then he painstakingly took the tree out of the dirt and removed every single little bit of dirt from the roots, and weighed the dirt that he had at the end, and he found that it was only it had only lost a tiny fraction of the weight of the tree, and so obviously. The tree was not just sucking up dirt and turning it into tree. The, the actual stuff the tree was made up of had to come from somewhere else. And so he did an hypothesis and that it was coming from the air, and he did, an ex, he did experiments, and he proved that, yes, trees are sucking something from the atmosphere and using it to make themselves. And that led to a whole bunch of other different discoveries, but it... But the first step was observation, and then was an experiment. And then the very important thing that some of us never, ever managed to do is um, to, to go on and compare the results of your experiment to reality. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's one thing to... One thing to go ahead and, you know, have a hypothesis and make an experiment. But if you don't then look at what the experiment actually reveals, and if you're not willing to redo your hypothesis, then you're not doing the scientific method. You're just pretending to be a scientist. And then once you've once you've gotten your experiment, compared to your, the results to your hypothesis, then you can draw your conclusions finally. Then you can finally say, okay, you know, trees are absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and using them to build their tissues. That's what that's how trees grow. And then other people, this is also a very important step, step six, other people test your conclusions. They they repeat your experiment. They look at it from different angles. They say, well, okay, maybe it's carbon dioxide, maybe there's other things. But then they, they, they're always testing you, and they're always, frankly, in the scientific community, they're trying to prove you wrong. And if they can't prove you wrong, then what you have hypothesized and experimented and the truth that you have discovered and proposed, then that's when it gets accepted as actual truth. Now, what we have now in America way too much of is people jumping to the conclusion, not comparing the results of what they're doing to reality, and not accepting when other people 
find out that they're wrong and not accepting contrary results. And I'm afraid we saw that this past week in Washington, D.C., where thousands, hundreds of thousands of people showed up ignoring the reality of viral infections. But I saw pictures of the people in that rally. I didn't see any masks. Well, I saw one out of 100 masks, maybe. And I saw people crowded together. You know, essentially what they're doing is they're testing the hypothesis. Is this how COVID spreads? Can I get sick doing this? They're running an experiment on themselves and their and their neighbors and their buddies. Uh, but then they're not accepting the results of those experiments. We have lots of data that it's showing that people go into these rallies without masks, people who ignore social distancing, get COVID and die. And I, I saw one estimate that Trump's rallies as of mid-November had sickened uh, some tens of thousands of people and killed about 700, according to epidemiologists. Those people have their political truth that they've come to, but they haven't applied anything like the scientific method to get there. They just leapt to the conclusion they wanted because it matched their worldview, and they stayed there. <laughs> and unfortunately, if things didn't have any consequence, we could just all live like that. It would be wonderful. We could all just live the realities that we prefer. Unfortunately, there is something called objective reality, and uh, one of the best ways we have to get there is the scientific method. And that's why I'm always so happy to have scientists on my show because they're pursuing that objective reality in their specialty, in that area that they like to study. And we're very grateful that we have a guest today. Our guest is a returning guest, Dr. Julia Halo. Dr. Halo, are you on the line? Yes, I am, Joe. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Good morning, and welcome to For a Green Future. Could you just remind our listeners uh, you know, who you're with and, and what you're what you do exactly? Uh, well, I am an assistant professor uh, in my fifth year at Bowling Green State University, so I'm in the Department of Biological Sciences. Um, I run a research laboratory there, um, and we we study um, sort of their small, discrete genetic elements that are capable of copying themselves throughout a genome, and uh, so they are mutagenic and they cause disease, but they also do some good things for, for us as well. Uh-huh. So, so you specifically study viruses that stick parts of themselves into the into the genetics of other animals and, and that it stays there. Yeah, that's correct, Joe. So there there's a so we study one type of virus. So if you know if we sort of take a step back, viruses can be made up of sort of two types of uh, what we call nucleic acid. And so DNA is a nucleic acid, RNA is a nucleic acid also. And so I think that I think that, you know, with this year and the pandemic, people are a little bit more familiar with what RNA is. And so the coronavirus being an RNA virus. And so we also study RNA viruses um, and they have a unique property of, well, the, the particular ones that we study have a unique property of being able to copy their RNA into DNA. And then they can inject that, like you said, into the genome of the host. And so we sort of study these you could call them remnants of infections that we can now see in genomes that are not even just tens of thousands, but hundreds of thousands and even millions of years old. And so we can use that information to study sort of how viruses have evolved over these vast time scales and to look at how, how those viruses interacted with the host in the past. Uh-huh. So some early hominid there, some early human, like a, a Cro-Magnon or a or a uh, Homo habilis, maybe, uh, got sick mm -hmm. Got sick one day, and that virus happened to manage to get their DNA into that, that person's uh, genome, and it, that day of sickness for that one person is actually still with us today, millions of years later. That's true. You know, that, that brings up an interesting aspect. Um, so if we, if we, you know, st take a step back and take a broad view of our genome, just the human genome, 8% of it is um, derived from these types of uh, integrants of viral DNA. And so, um, and so these, these specific types of viruses are retroviruses. And I think that we're most familiar with HIV, which is one type of retrovirus, which is also, you know, introduced as a pandemic <clears throat> um, back a few decades ago. 
Um, and so when we think about this 8% of our genome being uh, virus-derived, if we take that in comparison, only about 1.5% is actually protein coding, you know, that makes up the proteins that make up our skin and our hair and make us look the way that we look. Um, and so those, those viruses are actually fixed, and so they're present in every single individual, which means that they were, like you just said, in one individual at one time at one point in history, and now we all share those in our genomes. Hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and so some of what's going on here with, this, with these new viruses like HIV and, like, um, the, and the, the newest virus, of course, the coronavirus, is actually reshaping us not, not, and our descendants, not just... It's not just something we're, we're dealing with today. It's a, it may well get into the genome and change things in the future. Yeah. So the the coronavirus that we that we're experiencing right now doesn't it, it won't get into our genome, but it does. Yes, it is. In fact, it is affecting how our evolution is and how our evolutionary tra- trajectory is. Um, in the case of you know, if you think about our ability to fight it, you know, those individuals that have even a slight advantage to be able to fight a virus or have a, you know, some sort of immune advantage to a virus will be more fit and they will therefore pass on their genes at a higher frequency than will people that, that don't. Hmm. Yeah, we like to think we've kind of evolved, you know, gotten past the whole survival of the fittest thing, but it's still very much an operation. Hmm. So, uh, <laughs> so to talk a little bit more about uh, the coronavirus, the, the, the covid um, it's a it's a novel virus. It's a new virus that's gotten into a, a new population, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about what typically happens when a, a new virus gets into a population. Um, you know, what sort of things in terms of spread? What sort of things happen in terms of uh, you know na- lethality? Uh, can you shed a little light on that? Yeah, I can. Um, so so you know. So if we think about um, pathogens, right? So a virus is a pathogen, and a pathogen is something that can infect us or other mammals or other, not even mammals, it could be, um, you know, bacteria. Bacteria have their own viruses. Um, and so if we think about this, we're, we are exposed to viruses um, and to other pathogens, I think at a much higher frequency than we would think that we really are. Um, and so we are exposed to these viruses, let's say on a daily basis, it's a constant basis, and for most of them, you know, we are able to recognize them. Our bodies are able to recognize them and say, you know, that, that's not me, and I'm going to attack that little particle or whatever it is and, and get rid of it. And so we have this, this process where we can sort of protect ourselves. But sometimes, you know, you are exposed to a virus or a population is exposed to a virus and it's able to infect someone. And so once it infects someone, it's then the question of whether it can transmit to another individual. And then once there's transmission between individuals, then there's the question of whether it can become an epidemic and whether it can undergo epidemic spread. And so that's exactly what we're seeing in this particular virus now. So this virus is a, it's a novel coronavirus. Um, that being said, like it, it is a coronavirus, but it has novel properties. And so it was able to infect an individual and that individual was able to transmit it to other individuals. And it spread with such a high rate, right? So it has such a high pathogenicity and such ease of viral spread that it, that it very quickly was spread throughout the population and now we see over the globe. And so when, when we're exposed to something like that, to a novel virus um, or to any novel pathogen really, it's something that our bodies have not seen before. And this is true of us as humans and this is also true of, you know, our cats and our pets and our and birds and, you know, the wildlife that we see outside. But whenever we are seeing, and by I say seeing, I'm saying our immune system is is detecting something that is completely novel, well, it's just that. It's completely novel. And so we don't really know how to deal with it yet, you know, at a, at a most basic level. And so when viruses like this emerge, and they're, they can be particularly pathogenic because the host is naive and it hasn't really been, it hasn't really experienced that pathogen before, and, you know, to put it at the most basic level, really, we really don't know what to do in the face of that pathogen yet because we haven't evolved with that pathogen yet. Mm-hmm. And so it can, it can take off very rapidly. Um, we, did a, we did a show a few months ago where we, we did uh, exponential growth. And what we did is we, 
we had a stack of quarters. We started the first minute of the hour with one quarter, and then we doubled that every minute of the show. And by the end of the show, the stack of quarters was out in the outer reaches of the solar system. It was uh, pretty impressive. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, that's potentially what we're looking at with, with a viral infection, exponential growth. Is that correct? Um, exponential or beyond exponential growth, yeah. If you, if you consider one individual, let's say, you know, let, let's make an extreme situation. And we have, we have a situation where um, every single person is able to infect more than one individual. So at that point, you, you essentially have a past ex- beyond exponential growth. Hmm. Wow. Uh, all right. Well, so um, if anyone has any questions for, for Dr. Uh, Halo, please uh, give us a call at 866-240-1065. She's not an expert in this particular virus, but she knows a lot more about viruses than the rest of us, and so it's a good opportunity to ask her some general questions. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit, uh, Dr. Halo, about the specific research that your team is doing right now? Sure, um, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so we... Well, we so as I as I told you earlier, so we studied these um, these uh, pieces of uh, remnants of viruses that infected the genomes of our ancestors even millions of years ago. Um, I'm particularly interested in in more recent infections, um, and so what we can do is we can take a genome, so the ge- the genome being the entire um, suite of DNA that's in your body, and so we. We are able to sequence those genomes so we can actually obtain the bases, right? So the base order of the, the A's and the G's and the C's and the T's. Those, and then we uh, can look are, at that. Those, uh, those ac- the four acids that make up DNA. Yes, okay. yes. And so we can, we're, what we're able to do now is, you know, with, with technology and how, how wonderful it is, we can, we can obtain the sequence of a whole, a whole individual. So we could, we could take a, a blood sample from you and obtain your genome and be able to sequence it and do some, even some basic comparative analysis within a very, very short period of time. So like one or two weeks, we could do something like that. And so we have individuals now, like we have the Human Genome Project. So this is a sequencing effort of, of over 2,500 individuals over the globe. So global populations on, on, on six continents. And we also have other genomes that have been sequenced, um, both in terms of their genetic diversity, so some indigenous populations. And then we also have genomes that are sequenced from individuals in disease studies. So one of those is um, the Cancer Genome Atlas. And so we have all of these resources that we can pull from, and we can say, well, if we search these genomes, what exactly can we find? And so, so we can use these for all sorts of different comparative analyses. And so you can imagine that the, the amount of data and the information that you can get out of studying, you know, genomes in the tens of thousands is really profound. And so I'm just looking at one little teeny tiny piece of that that we're interested in. And so these are these remnants of viral infections. And so what we search for specifically is evidence of more recent viral infections. And so, so before when I said that, you know, we have 8% of our genome that's, that's that's fixed, meaning fixed meaning every single person on Earth shares those that that particular eight percent. And so, what I'm very interested in is, well, what about additional copies of viruses that are present that might have integrated themselves into our genomes, you know, into our ancestor genomes? Let's say in the last couple hundred thousand years. And those aren't actually fixed among everybody. And so, the, the entire human population does not share those insertions. And so, we call those unfixed. And they tend to bear more close resemblance to viruses that are infectious and able to circulate. And they even, they even have maintained some viral functions. And so we're, we're very interested in studying those types of infections. Huh, that, that's uh, fascinating. So the, so the viruses that managed to get into some people's DNA, the more recent ones, ha- haven't lost as, many, as much of their virus-ness and and so they're they still they're still a little bit wild there in our in our genetics. That's a really great way to put it that they haven't lost so much of their virusness. Yes, that's that's all, that's exactly what's happening. So hmm. what we see is that the older the insertion, so this you know this eight percent of our genome is is rather you know it, it's as you would say it's it's lost almost all of its virusness now. That being said, um, I guess that I'd like to point you to another direction. And that, so, you know, we, we study these, these, um, these types of viruses that are in our genome in terms of 
their association with disease. And so we know that in um, some different types of cancers and in some other diseases, we know that they are sort of deregulated. So some of them are actually expressed. Now, it doesn't mean that they're doing any, you know, it doesn't mean that they're infectious or that they're, you know, there's, they're, they're infecting other people or even infectious within the same individual. But maybe what we want to do is maybe we can use the information that they are being expressed as sort of a biomarker, right? So if we have a certain type of disease, do we also see um, an association of maybe the same site being deregulated in that disease? And there's also the question of whether the proteins that are expressed um, actually have any sort of causative effect on the disease, or if they're just expressed because there's a disease state in general, and so things are being deregulated in general, and that's sort of the, the, the side that I tend to I tend to err towards. But hmm. then we also have insertions that have been what we call co-opted, and these are absolutely fascinating um, cases. And so what we have is, let's say, of this eight percent, you know, we we all share at least you know a couple different insertions that we've borrowed over our evolutionary history for our own physiology. And so, so we've done this in sort of two ways that I, that I can talk about sort of quickly. One is um, in, um, during pregnancy, there's a, viral, um, there's a viral protein that is expressed on a trophoblast. And so this is sort of after fertilization, we have a ball of cells. And so there's a viral protein that is expressed on that trophoblast. And then in the uterine lining, there is a receptor for that protein. Uh-huh. And this, this protein that's expressed is, is sort of the same as, you know, this spike protein that we hear about on the coronavirus. What this is, is it's a protein that allows a virus to get into a cell. And so the cell that a virus is going to infect has to have a receptor that is bound by that particular protein. And so in my case, this, this protein is called the envelope protein. And so what this does is this envelope protein, so this virus protein from from millions of years ago that is present now in every single human being, binds to, during pregnancy, it binds to the receptor that's expressed in the uterine lining, and what we get is implantation. So they, they fuse together, and this causes implantation of the trophoblast into the uterine lining. Wow. So that's just one case of how it, it's really, really fascinating. And that's also happened multiple times over evolutionary history in different mammals. And so we have this one particular, so it's called, it's called HERV-W, so Human Endogenous Retrovirus W, if anybody's interested. Wow. But we have this one, <laughs> this one protein, yeah, from a virus. And so this has happened in our evolutionary history. Hmm. If we look at, say, dogs and cats, they have a completely different one that came from a completely different retrovirus, but it serves the same purpose. Um, if we look at sheep and goats, they also have a completely different one that arose completely evolutionarily independently. Rabbits are the same thing. So there is a great advantage that we've had in our own mammalian evolution that has come directly from this protein that's, in, that's uh, encoded in these uh, retroviruses. Wow, that the is other thing, amazing. Oh, okay, go ahead. The, the other, I'm sorry, I get excited. But, well, yeah. Uh, the other... The other really great thing that we've been able to sort of um, use these viral proteins for, co-opt them for, and it's the exact same protein. And so I just told you that, you know, if a cell is going to be infected by such a retrovirus or any virus, it has to have a receptor on it. And the virus that's going to um, infect that cell has a protein on the outside of the virus, and that protein has to bind the receptor, and it's a very, very specific interaction. Like a key in and a lock. So in the it is, it's like a very precise key in a lock. It's, it's mm-hmm. the one key in the one lock, yes. Okay. And so, so you can imagine now we have a retrovirus, and the retrovirus is able to infect a cell, and in order to have an infection, a productive infection, like we said, it has to make a copy of its genome, so a copy of the virus genome, and then it inserts that copy into your own genome. Now, just like we've been able to borrow this envelope protein for um, purposes during um, our pregnancy and, and during trophoblast implantation, we've also borrowed the same viral protein, so the same envelope protein. Now, this is from a different virus, from a different infection, but again, this is present in every single person on the planet in that 8% that we, that we talked about that's fixed among the population. And so in this, in this particular protein, what it does is it's able to bind receptors and sequester them. And so they sequester the receptor away from the cell, thereby preventing 
infection from an incoming virus that would use the same receptor. And this has also been seen not just in humans, but we have examples of this in, in several other mammals as well, in several different types of retroviruses. Hmm. Cool. Wow. Well, obviously we could talk about this, you know, <laughs> for the whole day and, well, not just for the whole hour, but for the whole day. But uh, unfortunately, we're we're running out of time here, Dr. Halo. But it's it's been fascinating. We'll definitely have to have you on for some more uh, talk about it. And I just wanted to to mention that uh, someone close to me is is uh, battling cancer right now, and uh, she's actually going to go to uh, a clinical trial of a virus, a viral therapy, where the the virus has been genetically engineered to just attack the cancer cell directly, um, which is mm-hmm. just another example of how, you know, that it's it's a mixed bag with viruses. I mean, they cause us these diseases, but uh, if you look at the whole evolutionary and ecological picture, our relationship is a lot more complex than just they're trying to eat us. <laughs> so Yeah, that's a really great way to put it. Yeah, well, well, thanks so much for being on, Dr. Halo. Really appreciate it. And, and just as it, do you have any advice for people in general in coping with this, uh, with the, the current novel virus that that we're being attacked by? Well, I think that I think that um, you know it's it's just my advice, but of course my advice is to just you know have respect for the people that are around you, and it's quite easy to um, to do that. And um, so you know when I go out, I try to adhere to protocol as much as I possibly can, and you know, when I am on campus at, at Bowling Green State, it's um, it's actually, it feels good to be on campus there right now with the students that are there. And the students in general, you know, when you go outside, even even outside in campus, everybody has their mask on. They're, they're you know, they're spread out. They're not together too much. And um, I find that to be a very high level of respect for their peers and for their elders. And I just, I think that everybody should just have that respect as well. Hear, hear. All right, Dr. Julia Halo, thanks so much for being on. All right, thanks, Joe. I really appreciate it. Bye. All right, so that was Dr. Julia Halo, and uh, she's somebody who knows about viruses, and she is following the protocols and taking this thing seriously. And my advice to you is that you should, too, uh, no matter what kind of truth you believe, even if you don't believe it's true, just do it anyway. Just, you know, humor the rest of us including the scientists. All right, and, but one thing that I don't need to ask you to humor, one thing that we'll, you will actually get great pleasure from is uh, our sponsor. Uh, we Four Green Futures brought to you by the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They restore wildlife habitats, and they lead in outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. And there are several ways to get a hold of them. One is their website, which is simply wcparks.org. And then uh, we could also go to their phone number, which is 419-353-1897. They've got Facebook pages, they've got Twitter accounts, uh, and of course they have their terrific app, which you go to the App Store and just search for WC Parks. That's the Wood County Park District. Okay, and Four Green Futures also brought to you by our patrons, and our patrons are wonderful people who have gone to patreon.com, and they searched for Four Green Future, and our show popped up there as something they could support and they just looked through the, the monthly membership levels and picked the level that, that fit their budget. And they are now, you know, every week, t- a little bit is coming out of their checkbook and coming into our program, and it really helps us bring you this information. And I, I think that we're bringing kind of unique information to Northwest Ohio. I mean, I I haven't heard a, a, an interview like the one we just had with Dr. Armstrong, or Dr. Halo on any other show in the region, so... If you like to keep that kind of information coming, if it if you find it interesting, uh, consider becoming a patron. Okay, ah, I see a light on on the council. Rebecca, are you on the line with us? I am. Yes. Hooray! Welcome to the show. Thank you. 
So what what did you think of what Dr. Halo had to say there? It turns out we all not only have virus in us, but we've become dependent on part of that virus for the very act of having babies. Right. So embryos could not implant without virus remnants, she's saying, basically. Well, I, I think probably what it is is it implants a lot better. That that would be my right. guess because right. there, there had to be sense. humans before that virus got incorporated into our genome. But um, right. But I suspect it gives you a big – you're a lot more successful at it, you know. Creating, cool. creating pregnancies, you know, creating offspring is one of the trickiest things that organisms do. So any little advantage they can get doing that is going to uh, give them a big advantage in terms of uh, evolution. So. And I feel like it should be pointed out that uh, uh, it sounded like, okay, I think it, it looked like something else when I saw it written down. But it, when, you, when you're saying her name, it sounds like her name is Dr. Halo, which which sounds like an awful lot like a, uh, somebody who would be in a superhero comic strip. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, or Maybe a... is like the supervillain or maybe like, you know, the doctor in the lab who creates the superhero or something is <laughs> that kind of person. You know, so I think we should keep our eye on her. Yeah, well, yeah, you always have to question scientists. I mean, that's part of science. But, uh, uh, yeah, that is her actual name, H-A-L-O, Dr. Halo. Okay. So, yeah. and, and no, as far as I know, no relationship to the vi- a famous video game of the same, uh, with the same. Okay, movie. yeah. But, yeah, but, uh, no, she's great. Uh, well, so you had something interesting for us, I think. Is that correct? I did. All right. Yeah, a couple people have been um, posting lately on Facebook about the fact that there are a lot of black squirrels in the Old West End this year, including I've seen them around, and uh, I was wondering why. So I looked it up, and, uh, you know, there are theories, but, okay, basically, first of all, what a black squirrel is not a species. Uh, the, the difference between squirrels which are black and squirrels which are gray is mostly that the, the, the black squirrels are black, it turns out. Um, <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> that's, <laughs> they, they are, uh, they, what are they? Okay, they're a melanistic subgroup or tr- trope, trope, something. Mm-hmm. No, morph, that's what it is. They're a morph. A mor- they're a color okay. morph produced by an abnormal pink pink gene. Mm-hmm. And um, they, they occur in like four different species of squirrels at least, including the one that's mostly around here in the Great Lakes Basin, uh, Michigan, Canada, around around this part of Ohio is, is, uh, is a color morph of the eastern gray squirrel. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and of course, you know, a couple things have to happen. Uh, they apparently originated with fox squirrels, actually, which are live in the southeastern part of the country, but there's interspecies breeding with the gray squirrels. Uh-huh. So that's how the color morph got into the gray squirrels. Um, yeah, and I, I would yeah. use I would use the word uh, not usual as opposed to abnormal because. Uh, you know, these kinds of variations are actually part of nature. They, 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 it is sort of a right. normal process. So uh, it's, it's a little bit less common than the other ones, but right. still, you know, it's, it's it's not super weird. <laughs> you know, right. It's not abnormal in the sense of AB normal in the uh, in the in the you know in the car- in, in the young Frankenstein. Young Frankenstein oh, or okay, good, good. These these black yeah. squirrels aren't going to start trying to attack us or anything. Okay. Go on. Yeah, they're 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 cool like that, but yeah, uh, apparently it requires two of the melanistic genes, one from each parent, to make a black squirrel. So two gray squirrels cannot have one. Um, there has to be if if you if you have two dark if you have two true black squirrels, you get black squirrel babies. If you have a a gray and a black squirrel that in your breed, then you get sort of uh, blackish brown ones, sort of brownish black ones. Hmm. Um, yeah, and okay, there are all kinds of theories about why this might be. Um, one of them, and this is interesting to me because lately, uh, right at the corner, uh, uh, on the uh, grounds of the uh, glass pavilion of the Toledo Museum of Art, I've been seeing dead critters, including a, c- a couple of dead uh, gray squirrels. Hmm. So little, one of them looked like it, it just there was just a tail left, really, and a few scraps, like a hawk got it. But then I saw a couple that were... One that was completely unmarked and, and a bird that was, well, I'm not going to describe it, but it was mutilated in interesting ways. Um, mm. <laughs> so, like, what's going on there? One of the theory is that black squirrels, of course, you know, what do you call them? Mutations occur in a gene, but in order for the muta- mutated individual offspring to survive, 
it has to have like a uh, that gene has to have a sort of a, a, a neutral to positive effect or mild negative effect. And, you know, it has to not be a serious threat, at least. So some theories are that the squirrels are still around. Apparently, there like there were a lot of them in the 1700s, and then they fell off for some reason with urbanization. But uh, weirdly, black squirrels are more common in ur- urban areas. Uh, except there's this one part of Ontario where they're really thriving in the farmland, so whatever, you know. <laughs> Nobody's mm. sure about that. Um, yeah, one of the things might be that they offer better coniferous, uh, better concealment in coniferous forests, which tend to be darker, apparently, because they offer more, I don't know, higher, they, they throw more it's, shade. Yeah, yeah it, it's, <laughs> it's much darker. <laughs> whatever. A, yeah, I don't know if, if yeah. you've ever had the opportunity to be in a in a very, very deep, uh, coniferous forest with nothing but pine trees, but but yeah, that that can be oh, it can be really 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 dark in those. That's really cool actually. So well, I could see. Studies, mm-hmm. Yeah, I uh, I've, been, I've had enough experience with coniferous forests to see where this might be true. You know, just mm-hmm. sort of coniferous patches of trees versus the other kind. But yeah, uh, there there've been studies that show that they are less visible in motion than the gray squirrels, whereas gray squirrels are less visible at rest. Hmm. So, so if, if you're, you're a gray squirrel, you want to like try to freeze as much possible. I right. Guess. I don't know. But if you're also, constantly being they, constantly being chased or jostled or have to keep moving around, maybe it is better to be a black squirrel than a gray squirrel. Hmm. Maybe it is. Yeah, they're they're uh, the black squirrels are more tolerant to uh, human noises. They think possibly, and also it's possible they. They may offer uh, better, less, they're less visible in burned forests, forests which just have been burned, which would not explain Toledo. Also, <laughs> okay, but the leading theory seems to be that the, the, the advantage of black squirrels, they're found further north, and they tend to be more active during, uh, during like the early morning and, and later in the day. They think this is because they absorb uh, heat with their fur, because black tends to absorb heat. And they actually did studies, and they 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 retain eighteen. They have eighteen percent less heat loss wow. than the, than gray squirrels. That's a that's so, significant. Hmm. So so solar powered kind of, squirrels basically. Yeah, which right. you know the the temperature is all out of, over the place right now. So nobody knows like why why would this be good? Uh, it could be nature is just sort of running things off the the flag and seeing what salute what what conditions salute. You know. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, thanks a lot, Rebecca. That's that was a. I, I've been wondering. Uh, Bowling Green also this year, I've noticed, had an unusual number of uh, of black yeah, yeah. squirrels. So, so it's not just yeah. uh, Toledo. Hmm. It's happening so everywhere. Yada, we don't really know. <laughs> right. <laughs> the, the but we have answer to well, that question. Right. Well, a scientific method, like we're talking about this show. You know, we're we're still in. Now we're just we're observe. We've observed it. There's a lot more black squirrels, and now. We're, we're, people are ready to start making some hypotheses, but and they're exactly. starting to do some experiments, but we're a long way from the it's generally accepted as true kind of thing. All right. right. Well, but uh, speaking of scientific method and experiments, it's time to go on to Eco News. And uh, this first story that we have this week is from uh, Yale Environment 360, their website. Actually, this is an older story. It was back in June of uh, 2019, June 24th, 2019. But uh, I found it when I was doing the research for today's show, and it turns out that trees emit methane. (laughs) Now, this is a long, long way from uh, those of us who are a little older remember Ronald Reagan making the claim that uh, trees actually put out more pollution than than cars do, which uh, is an example of the not scientific method, the unscientific method, which is you, you you just say what you want to be true because then, like, he figured he didn't you'd have to do anything about auto pollution because if trees put out more, no, that that is completely not true. But it turns out that trees do actually put out methane, and especially trees that are in rainforests during the flooded season. Um, and and it's not that much. It's uh, for a two and a half acres, one hectare puts it literally a couple of pounds per day of methane, which over the entire rainforest covering South America is probably around 40 million tons a year, which is a lot, but it's still just a tiny, tiny fraction of 
of the billions of tons that we put of greenhouse gases we put into the air. But it's enough that it was they were unsure of the the methane budget in the on the planet. You know, the satellites were looking at the a- amount of actual methane and they were running all their simulations saying, you know, okay, methane's going in here and there and there. Here's how much there should be in the in the world. But the satellites are telling us, no, there's actually a significant little bit more. And they figured out that it's, it, it's actually coming from trees. This is not to say cut down trees. <laughs> Definitely not, because the net effect of trees is clearly they absorb more greenhouse gases than they emit. But it also suggests that just randomly, willy-nilly planting trees all over the world, the way some businesses and some uh, governments are suggesting now, that's not necessarily going to solve global warming unless, you know, you've got to be a little smart about this whole methane generation thing because it's a, a plus and a minus. Uh, so that I thought that was interesting. Another hurricane report we're following, of course. Now we are on to Hurricane Iota, as we predicted last week, may might well happen. Um, and, you know, Science Daily now on November 11th did a story that's, that basically they've proven, yes, climate change causes the, the landfall hurricanes to stay stronger for longer. And the, the reason is pretty simple. The, the ocean is warmer now than it was. And so the, the storms go into the land carrying more water and more energy with them. And so they can stay hurricanes as they get deeper and deeper into the into the continent. And the way they came up with this is that they just all they did was they took hurricanes more than 50 years old and hurricanes from now to 50 years ago and uh it's very clear that with the cooler ocean, hurricanes, when they hit landfall, they immediately would weaken when it was, you know, back in the old days. Uh, but now that the ocean is, is warmer, it's heating up, the hurricanes are keeping their strength. And so the scientists that did it warned that inland cities, you know, even places maybe like Toledo, have to start getting, in Columbus, have to start getting ready for the possibility that some of these storms could still be at tropical storm or hurricane strength when they get this far inland and we're not we're not really ready for that um and of course north carolina saw that uh with with uh, just this past storm because they they got flooding farther inland than they're than they're used to now i'm not saying that this is uh because north carolina went for donald trump uh you know but i'm just i'm just making an observation you know the state went for trump and then it got by a massive, uh, massive storm that caused lots of damage. Of course, they're not alone. Uh, over in the Pacific Ocean, where they have typhoons, and typhoons are literally hurricanes. They're actually the same thing. They just use the word typhoon in, in the Pacific and hurricane in, in the Atlantic. But they're up to V. They, they just had Typhoon Vamco, and uh, it's it hit. Uh, it's on its way to hit uh, Vietnam which is reeling from the previous storm that just cleared. And so there, and you know, tens of thousands of people are evacuating and they're, they're bracing for a lot of damage. But this is something that we ecologists, that we, that atmospheric scientists and ecologists, and we were telling people this way back in the 1980s, 40 years ago, we were saying, this is on the way, this is gonna come. It's gonna happen unless we stop this, stop putting carbon in the air. And we were ignored. And that brings us to our, our last e- bit of eco news. And that is, uh, this is a story, actually it ran on NPR at, on October 20th. And it, it's another warning that we gave people was GMO crops, genetically modified crops. We said, if you genetically modify the crops to put virus or to put um, toxins in there, that didn't evolve naturally, those toxins are going to lose their potency and uh, become useless. And that is exactly what has happened now with uh, Bacillus thuringis, thuringiensis, or BT, as it's called. You might have heard of BT corn or BT cotton. Those are genetically modified plants that had the gene from a bacteria that created a protein that kills caterpillars and and worms, things like cutworm, 
by uh, liquefying their insides. Basically, the bacteria would release this protein to liquefy the insides of the caterpillars or whatever, so they could they could grow in there nice and easy in that little caterpillar soup. On, and, uh, you know, they've been doing that for millions of years. The Bacillus thuringiensis evolved along with caterpillars and cutworms and insects. And so, you know, they've been doing it for millions of years. But now we took that gene out, we put it into all these plants, and just as we predicted, ecologists predicted, all the, the pests are becoming resistant to us to it. And part of it was that the, the farmers are largely ignoring the advice on how to do it because they're after profit, they're planting as much. But one th- angle on this that even though NPR reported on this, there was no mention of this at all, and it's actually the most important aspect to this story, and that is that now BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, in the wild can no longer fill the role that has filled evolutionarily because it has protected plants from from insects and, and cutworms. It's been a limiting factor on uh, the things that eat plants for, for millions of years. And by destroying the effectiveness of its protein, by destroying the effectiveness of, what, of its strategy for coexisting in the wild, you take it out of the ecosystem. You pluck it out and you change the ecosystem possibly forever. And so, yeah, the, in the, the stories on it were talk about, oh, the economic impact, now cotton has to use more pesticides and things like that. But the ecological impact long term is much, much more serious than, than a couple farmers not having a good crop of cotton one year. And I also saw we also saw this with uh, penicillin, and it reminded me of way back when I was a kid. Penicillin mold. We were a, a common experiment. You were told just get a piece of bread to get it wet, set it on your counter, and just keep it damp. And magically, penicillin, this this blue green uh, mold, would would start growing on it. And that's cool. You know that was a, a science experiment everybody could do. But then we took penicillin and we overused it to the point where the, the penicillin's antibacterial effect no longer works. The bacteria have managed to evolve beyond penicillin because of the way we misused it. So now if you do that same experiment, I did it back in the 60s as a kid. Now if you do it, most likely what you're going to get is black mold. And black mold is toxic to humans. Because because penicillin has lost its its ability to fight off bacteria to, to compete with the bacteria because we messed up we've destroyed penicillin just like now we've destroyed Bacillus Bt's uh, you know evolutionary trick and we have to remember when we tar- start applying these things the ecological the long term ecological impact is much 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 more important than the short-term economic gain. A few people so got... This would, yeah, go ahead. This would be because the things that, uh, like, okay, the bacteria that the penicillin, the mold was fighting, got stronger as a result of all this penicillin being used medicinally, right? Yeah, mold and bacteria compete with each other right. when there's food stuff like wet bread to eat. And, right. And penicillin mold is no longer able to compete the way it used to, it, it's it's getting crowded out of the the ecosystem, and because it, the bugs have got done got stronger. Okay, because, yeah, because the bacteria <laughs> right. are now yeah. now la- now laugh it off. They're like <laughs> penicillin. Yeah. That's so 1990s. You know, it's, it's yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> that's not good. No. Not good at all. <laughs> no, and and so that nobody is studying the well. Very few people are studying the 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 huge upturning upchurning of the ecosystems that that are being caused by these changes that we're bringing about because we're misusing these tools. Now, it would have been possible to use BT in agriculture, maybe even in a genetically modified organism, but it had to be a limited thing. You also had to plant non-BT cotton so that the, you know, so that the cutworms that it got uh, immune to it wouldn't have an evolutionary advantage. Uh, sometimes up to half your crop could have, should have been non-BT, ne- right next to your BT crop. 
But nobody did that because every, because the reason they did it in the first place, the reason they mutated these poor cotton and corn plants was to make more money. And uh, you don't make more money by, by following these protocols. That, that You make lots of money fast. So there were millionaires made. There were even a couple billionaires made. But now everybody is poorer because, um, for one thing, Organic farmers used to use BT. They would just spray the bacteria directly on the crop, which didn't change the ecological balance at all because BT is a naturally occurring bacteria. But putting it, putting the genes into plants just churned up, messed up the whole thing. All right. Well, so the, the, the caterpillar similar would have gotten immune to this bacteria is what you're saying. No, they wouldn't have because that no. bacteria no. in the wild coexisted with the caterpillars for millions of years, and they never developed immunity. All right. All right so, but uh, now they have. Yep. Yeah. All right. Real quick, letter for the okay. future, very short. Uh, dear GGG, Michael and I are getting married. He proposed to be this past Wednesday as we were sitting bundled up in heavy coats and wool blankets watching the northern lights. We're going to get married in December, and I guess we're going to have to stop there because we've run out of time. All right. Thanks so much for listening. This is Joe Damar. And Rebecca Wood. Signing off. But that nuclear power's got us a sin and fight.